there's been um, a tendency in the past decade to move away from problems of what's in the text and what translators do in their translations towards questions of who the translators are. And in fact, the, the term translation studies, uh, it's been proposed that we should open a new field called translator studies, studies of who the translators are. This movement isn't accidental. It follows a, a general shift in the nature of the humanities, even in linguistics, which was the science that was looking most closely at, at texts. Linguistics has moved from the study of, of, of sentence level structures <coughs> to pragmatics, that is, how language completes actions in the world, and uh, indeed to social linguistics, how different people in different social groups are using languages differently. Uh, that the move towards the human has been something that's been going on for, for a long time in linguistics. Uh, it also matches up with, with a debate really in the late 80s, 1990s between sociology and philosophy. Uh, there was this relativization of ideas, of, of ethics, saying that whatever ideas you come out with, whatever theories you come out with, it's only because of where you're positioned in the world. Okay, so in translation studies we come up with things like, with things like translation studies developed in minor cultures. Because minor cultures depend more on translations than major cultures do. Therefore, our ideas are coming from the position of minority. Okay? In that way, you can pick up a sociological proposition you're in a minor culture, so you think a certain way, uh, and apply it to what seem to be absolutist type, type propositions about translation or about anything else. So the real debate was between sociology, saying everything you think is only because of where you are and your social group and your interests, and philosophy, uh, which still wanted and still wants to retain the, the supremacy of ideas. Of course, the, the retort from philosophy is that, ah, but you guys who sociologists are using ideas, and you took the ideas from us, so we are the kings after all. Okay, you have this struggle between disciplines within the humanities. Part of that has filtered through to translation studies. So, the apparently banal question, who are translators, would not have been asked in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, or even into the 80s, it might have been asked around Skopos theory, but wasn't a great deal. Uh, that the, the client's instructions, that text, somehow reigned supreme. There was no real sociology at work there. Uh, but it has been asked more frequently into the 90s and, and since then. <coughs> It challenges the absolute nature of anything we say about text and matching operations or mapping operations that occur on that linguistic level. The intermediary, the translator or interpreter, is likely to be mistrusted, I think. Mistrust. You want them to be on your side, but you can never be sure. Why can't you be sure? Because they know so much about the other side. You are all likely to be mistrusted at some part of your career. You've been <coughs> sold out, you've been corrupted, you've been picked up and seduced by the foreign. There are two basic ways that a society tries to solve this problem. I'm taking the terms from Michael Cronin, I don't think they're good terms, but we could invent other ones. It can train its own. If most of our societies have set up training institutions for translators in the past 20 years, as they have, it's because we can produce our own, so we've got to trust them all. Autonomous production. Or you can work heteronomously heteronomously and go and pick them up and find them elsewhere. Okay, So uh, Columbus, when he was heading out 
to the New World, which he thought was going to be India. But he thought he might have hit China as well, because he had a letter for the Great Khan with him, in Latin. He was sure that the Emperor should read Latin. Uh, he took with him an interpreter, uh, a Jew who spoke seven languages, including Chaldean, Hebrew, Arabic, uh, Arabic uh, plus a few European languages, and they were sure one of them would have to work. And uh, when he got to what's now the, uh, the Caribbean, <coughs> Dominican Republic, uh, he felt, of course, that his interpreter was entirely useless, and so he had to resort to the second strategy, which was go and capture a few natives, which he did separating some men from the women and taking them back so they would become his interpreters on the next voyage. Along the way, uh, he managed to produce a son because he carried out several trips over a period of years. And so uh, we don't know much about the mother of the son, but Diego Colón, the son of the admiral, 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 um, became an interpreter through a hybrid birth. Somebody came, was brought up with the two cultures. So you have really a third solution there, which is not in Michael Cronin's uh, terminology, interesting enough. You can have mixed, a mixed solution, a hybrid cultural location. Some of you are from that kind of family, bilingual, bicultural family. And you would be operating from within that hybridity and making use of it. I've been fascinated by the third solution in history, by the possibility that, that most um, key translators and interpreters are from that sort of hybrid background. It's not true all the time, quite obviously, but it might be true in some interesting cases. Certainly in Hispanic history, which is the one I've studied most, uh, I was looking for cases, I have a series of case studies uh, where I worked on this, and it's amazing that, that whenever there was social disturbance from the outside, uh, the first people to blame were translators, and not as translators, but they were either Jewish or Italians. Watch out for Italians. Okay. But Italians and, and Jews, for various reasons, at various stages, were among these communities that were intermediaries uh, uh, throughout Southern Europe and Northern Europe for Jews. So, I started to look at this broad hypothesis, that if we're between a culture and another culture, all cultures, to the extent that there's communication between them, have overlaps. And we are working in the overlaps, and we belong in the overlaps, because we have at least the two languages, probably the two cultures, or a good deal of them, and perhaps uh, a provenance, that is, we were either born into that intermediary position, or we were trained in it. We went to school in one place and in the other. Okay? And we've developed a place within those two cultures on a kind of meta level. And I work with the hypothesis that we belong to as kind of professional interculture. If I get a group of people here together for two years, I can form you, or you will be formed, or you will do it yourselves in your networking, into a kind of identity, a professional identity, that can work as a professional culture, rather like a company culture. We talk about Google culture, IBM culture, there might be a Miss culture as well. You have your primary provenance, you've got things to do with both cultures, but our work <coughs> is being carried out in this overlap space in the professional interculture. It's a hypothesis, it's something I like to play with. Now, this is a map it doesn't look like a map, granted. It has the 12th century down to there and the 13th century down to there. And across here you have a certain geography going from Antioch in, uh, in the Middle East right through uh, Italy, uh, Hispania, because in those centuries Spain didn't exist, uh, Paris, then going right through to London. Okay. And I'm trying to map something. I'm trying to map the way that knowledge uh, from Greek, 
that is about the stars, about the body, about animals, and about geography, the way that knowledge was being transferred from Arabic into Latin in the 12th century, and then into Romance, that is Spanish, Catalan, Aragonese, uh, Galician, all mixed together in the uh, 13th century. And the big dots represent translations I know, that I know of, where they happened, and when they happened. And then there are lines, uh, continuous lines represent the movements of the texts, and the dotted lines represent the movements of the translators that I know of. So I'm just trying to map what happened in a transfer of knowledge from one language to another. Now, what's of interest to me in this is the line. Can you see a line? There's a line that forms a sort of continuous place of translations being produced more or less in the one place. And that place is called Toledo, okay, which was the seat of the Archbishop in the 12th century. The Archbishop of Toledo sort of ruled the roost, and many of these translations were carried out for him. And in the 13th century, this is the reign of Alfonso the Learned, who had translations done for him. The map is wrong because his capital moved around Spain, so it should not be as continuous as it is here, but you get the idea. <coughs> now, you've heard this is the school of Toledo, if you've heard about it, okay? Now, what interests me is this question. I know what a line between cultures, between countries, a geopolitical border, I know what that is. Yeah, people agree, and it's a river or whatever, a mountain range or just a line on the map. What is the border between cultures? How do we define this place where cultures meet? Well, surely translations are the parts, are the places, are the, is the act in which the border is defined. If you produce a translation, by definition you say there's one language there, one language there, and they were in touch in this place and this time. And what I think I'm mapping here is the way the border was formed between Latin and Arabic, in fact, between Islam and Christianity. You might be interested, you might see why I'm so interested in this period of history. Europe's main problem at the moment, and the United States as well, is still between those major cultures. Now, the tricky bit for me is up here. Prior to the formation of any institutionalized border, when translators worked for the church and then worked for the crown, prior to that, you get these guys up here. And this is a group of four, five, or six translators who are moving into recently conquered territory in the north of Spain and the south of France, looking for knowledge. These are people who are intellectuals, in the truest sense of the word, and are picking up informants who, could, who know something of the local languages and of Arabic, are looking for manuscripts, and are carrying out translations for various clients. Usually the church, usually local church people, but whatever. And these are the people who carry out, um, among other things, the first Latin translation of the Quran. In, in 1143, a group of people in a region, it's just, they just say, in the region of the Ebro, which could mean anywhere in the north of Spain. We, we, we don't know where. They all knew each other. They worked with each other. They formed teams, and then new teams, and they had informants that went from one to the other. And when their job was done, they moved, some of them, to London or to Paris. That is, they were there to do a particular job, and they were basically nomadic intellectuals, and then once they'd done the job, they moved on to something else. That, for me, is sort of the model of an interculture. That, for me, is, is, is a model of, of, of how translation can affect 
the movement between languages and between cultures and, and translators as people can do it without being institutionalized by power, the power of the church, the power of the state. There's this interculture there. What happens later is the institutions say, ah, what you're doing is very interesting. I'm very interested in that knowledge. I'd like to know about medicine because I might get sick. Or the king says, oh, I'd like to know about the stars. Because if I know about the stars, I can predict the future. Idiot guy, but anyway. Uh, and so he got knowledge of astrology. Because he wanted to predict the future. Once you got that knowledge, he didn't know it at the time, but you can navigate with your ships. And this equipped Hispanic cultures to become the first people to circumnavigate the globe. Hispanic and Portuguese. You had to get that knowledge. Uh, so the, the stuff being transferred was not banal by any means. There you have it. I mean, I'm, I'm interested, it's just a hypothesis. It can happen that we are perhaps something like that. And perhaps we have a lot of power in the kinds of knowledge that we're moving between places. Or perhaps our intercultures will be institutionalized by your governments, by the State Department, the United Nations, the CIA, anywhere else you might like to work. But that's what happens. Okay. Um, some of the more traditional sociology, uh, many, there are many sociologies out there, and uh, the sociologist who's been picked up and has been applied to translation the most is probably uh, Pierre Bourdieu, French sociologist. Um, whose contribution to translation studies has been in terms of two concepts. One is habitus, which I'm not going to go into now, and the other is his theory of capitals, which I think is rather more useful for the kinds of things I'm explaining. I'm interested in this because I have to explain why these people do things and don't do it for money. Many of the translations that happened originally there were not commissioned by somebody who was going to pay for them. They're done for other reasons. Many of the literary translations that are done are, are very badly made. If, if you thought these were rational people doing literary translations today for the money, there's something wrong with your theory or something wrong with them. Uh, and a lot of the work being done can't be explained in terms of economic exchange. This is why Bourdieu's theory is of some interest, and it's of interest to this theory of intercultures. Now, we know there's an economic economy, a financial economy, where people work for and exchange money. You sell your labor for money. We're used to that one. Yep, if you're lucky. But Bourdieu realized, well, primitive Marxism believes this. You know, the whole society is basic money. Power and wealth, the distribution of wealth. And that wealth is measured in economic terms. People have become aware since Bourdieu, or earlier Basil Bernstein, in, uh, in social linguistics at least, that there are also other economies at work at the same time. We can exchange money for labor, but we also accumulate and exchange cultural capital. Cultural capital for Bourdieu means the skills, the things we can do, and our competencies. We know languages, minimum. We know how to translate. We might know about medicine, we might know about nuclear arms reduction or non-proliferation. We are then buying the skills. We pay money to get the skills, the cultural capital, and then we go out and sell the cultural capital to get money. Isn't that what you're doing? Isn't that why you're here? Yeah, you buy something so you can go out and sell it later. And it's a good thing to sell because you keep, it's one of the few things you can sell and you still keep it. Yeah. 